Hello, I think we are right bang on time. Good afternoon to my fellow listeners from around the world. A hearty welcome to Bahrain's Ignite Learning through webinars with District 20, Division C. If you've been following our webinar series so far, you'll know that yours truly is Saira Ranj, Assistant Program Quality Director with Division C. And today, we bring you yet another fun-filled, interesting, and informative session on a topic that inspires the world. Think about it. Humor connects, and who does not want to connect? If you've ever wondered, can someone actually learn the ability to be funny, or it's something that you're just born with? Well, to answer that question, we have someone here with us today. And who is he? Well, let me just tell you who he is. A sailor boy who's done quite a few trips around the sun, who has no qualms about wearing shocking colored garments over or under his attire. His mission in life is very, very simple, to reduce global whining and make this world a better place by teaching people how to find the humor in every tumor. So welcoming to the webinar desk today, I won't take too much time, someone whose voice and style is just as vibrant and warm as his personality. The maestro himself, Toastmaster Robert Devota. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Sarah, DTM Sarah for that lovely intro for me you know me in and out i never expected that but i should have known better <laughs> and to all my listeners who are out there thank you for taking the time to log in and listen to what we have to share with you today just to let you know that this is the very first time that i'm ever doing a webinar so it's like a, a like a virgin thingy for me and if i do trip up somewhere Please bear with me. You see, it's my first time. Yep. Let's get cracking with how to get people cracking a slice on humor. Now, let me share with you a bit of history behind how today's session on humor came to be. A couple of years ago, when DTM Sarah was still a Toastmaster in Dubai, it was when UAE 2 was a part of District 20. She had organized a YLP program for her gavel club. And she invited me to give an educational session on how to be humorous in speeches. I went there feeling a bit nervous and apprehensive as these were kids. And you know, kids, they can see through you in no time if you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, I still remember the rousing response I received from the Gavaliers and how much we laughed. I came away feeling energized and recharged. It reminded me of myself as a kid and how much more easier it had been to smile and laugh and be myself without any thought of how I was coming across and what others were thinking of me. Since then, I've embarked on a journey of spreading the word on the need for humor and where we can find it. I'm sure we'll agree that uh, today's world is in dire need of some seriousness detox with so much of uncertainty causing anxiety resulting in depression and disease there is a genuine need for humor to heal all these tumors. And so here I am, Dr. Funnybone, to begin my seriousness detox. By the end of this session, I'm hoping you will have an idea of where to look for your funny bone and who or what has been chewing on it. So let's begin with a question. What is humor? I looked it up in all the dictionaries and according to the Cambridge Dictionary, which sounds to me very reliable because I'm sure you'll agree with me, the name Cambridge sounds more English English as opposed to say Basin Bridge or Garud Bridge. So Cambridge says that humor is the ability to be amused by something seen, heard or thought about, sometimes causing you to smile or laugh or the quality in something that causes such amusement. I said, hmm, let's see something else. So I went to the Oxford Dictionary and the Oxford Dictionary defined it simpler as Humor being the quality of being amusing or comic, especially as expressed in literature or speech. That still did not satisfy me. I kept looking and I found my favorite definition of humor, 
is as stated by the Danish born American pianist and comedian Victor Borge, who said, Humor is something that thrives between man's aspirations and his limitations. There is more logic in humor than in anything else because you see, humor is truth. And my dear friends, that is a truth I've come to experience in my life, and that's why I'm so passionate about spreading it everywhere. Now that we know what is humor, let's get to why we need humor. So why humor? How can humor impact our lives? Can it impact our lives? It's a scientific fact that developing and exercising a sense of humor can help to ease anxiety and fear, manage setbacks more effectively, diffuse conflict and resolve disagreements. Who doesn't know about conflicts in today's world? Everywhere you turn, there's a conflict this or a conflict that and something that has been brewing for years and years and years. For sure, those, con those conflicts can use a bit of humor to resolve them. What else? Well, it can strengthen relationships and emotional connections. Humor loosens up people and it allows them to get closer to one another. It can relieve your stress. Who doesn't have stress in today's world? If any one of you out there says, I don't have any stress, I would like to talk to you privately. What is your secret? Humor can also boost your immune system. It can improve energy levels. And this is very important, the next point. It can put people in a very receptive mood to listen and accept our thoughts and ideas. So if you're going to broach a subject, uh, a pitch a proposal to someone and you are apprehensive about how they are going to take it, what will be their response? The best tool you can have in your armory is humor. You can break the ice with humor and once they laugh with you, they are already in a mood to listen to what you have to say with a much more open frame of mind than before. What else can it do? This one I think is very attractive to all you singles out there, especially the desperate ones who have tried everything and failed. Here's my advice to you. Try humor. You will get a better result and then you will need humor to live the rest of your life with that result. Now, According to Dr. Paul E. McGee, a PhD, he was an American researcher and he is a professional speaker now who spent 22 years of his life researching on the benefits of humor and its applications at home, at work, and at play. And he says, your sense of humor is one of the most powerful tools you have to make. You have to make certain that your daily mood and emotional state support good health. Now, this from a man who has spent 22 years of his life researching on the benefits of humor and his applications at home. And today he's a very well-known public speaker in America. He goes around the world telling people about the importance of humor and how they can em employ it in their personal life, in their professional life, and in their social life. And the best reason of all, according to me, is that it's free. You don't need an inheritance or a job or medical insurance to have a sense of humor. You don't need a license or a college degree. You don't need to have a red passport or a green passport or blue passport. You don't need to be black, white, brown, yellow, or even albino. You can be humorous whoever you are, wherever you are. You don't need physical space to store it. All you need is the space between your ears. And we all have plenty of that, right? I know I do. And I'm just as human as any of you. So what more reasons do you need to adopt humor as a life-saving tool in your life? I can imagine after listening to all the benefits of having humor in your life, the question uppermost in your minds could be, where can I find it? Can I be humorous? Where do I start? Whoops, I'm running ahead of myself there. Where do you start? You can start by getting a pet. Here's something that many of you would not have expected me to say, to get a pet. And you'll be surprised to note 
that the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia, which is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Now, I don't know why they left out the P, don't ask me, but it's called the CDC. And the CDC says that these are the following benefits to having a pet. It decreases your blood pressure, decreases cholesterol, decreases triglycerides. Imagine how much money you will save on doctor's bills and medications for the whole family. It decreases feelings of loneliness, increases opportunities for exercise and outdoor activities, increases opportunities for socialization. And here's the interesting part, can help you get dates. Mm -hmm. All you desperate singles, are you hearing me? Pets can be very playful. And when you indulge in bouts of play with your pets, you naturally tend to become lighthearted and more open to viewing situations from a lighter perspective, providing the ideal platform for humor to bloom in your life. So yeah, get a pet if you can, preferably the more docile, lovable kind than the type that evokes sheer terror in the eyes of onlookers. It's humor we are trying to induce here, not a tumor. The next little thing that you can do is practice how to smile. See that kid just smiling away with gay abandon. I remember reading this in my dentist's office. A smile is a little curved line that can set many crooked things straight. So smile, it increases your face value. Smiling is contagious. And when we smile, we activate neurons in the brain that fire a synchronizing feature. You'll notice that one smile will lead to additional smiles, not just for you, but for those around you. Studies show that children smile an average of 400 times a day. An average happy adult, 40 to 50 times a day. And an average adult, which includes you and me, only 20 times a day. Do the math, people. Why do you think we are more attracted to smiling children than grumpy adults? So start with yourself. Smile at yourself in the mirror. Now I understand it can be difficult for some of us considering the mugs we have been blessed with, but hey, if I can smile at my face in the mirror, then I'm sure all of you can. Start smiling at your partners, your spouses, your children, your coworkers, the security guard, the cashier behind the counter, the waiter. Let the world start wondering what the hell is going on with you. Smiling is the beginning of laughter. Pioneers in laugh therapy find it's possible to laugh without even experiencing a funny event. The same holds true for smiling. When you look at someone or see something even mildly pleasing, practice smiling. It's free and it's easy. Anybody can do it. What next can you do to start becoming humorous? You can count your blessings. Now, when I say count your blessings, I don't just mean it generically by saying, oh, I'm grateful for all that's good in my life and leave it at that. No, I want you to literally make a list. Go into a little more detail and start to be grateful for the fact that you woke up this morning, that you could get out of bed, that your bowels moved this morning. That's not a joke. It can be a real challenge for some of us to get our bowels to move. Be grateful that water flowed when you opened the tap in the wash basin, that the water is clean and fit for human consumption, that you have the privilege of having a washroom for yourself instead of having to share it with a number of people in an open space. Think about that. Be grateful that there is a clean towel to wipe yourself dry, that you have a set of washed and pressed clothes to wear, that you can afford to have breakfast every day, that you live in a city where there's reliable public transport or that you own your own vehicle and so on. Can you see what I am getting at? The simple act of considering the good things in our life will distance us from negative thoughts that are a barrier to humor and laughter. If we really start paying attention to the details of everything we have to be grateful for in our lives, then our attitude of gratitude will keep us in a state of inner happiness, which will make it easier for us to smile and laugh and be receptive to humor. So people, count your blessings.
the next thing that you can do to become more humorous is spend time with fun and playful people these are people who laugh easily both at themselves and at life's absurdities and who routinely find the humor in everyday events their playful point of view and laughter can be contagious now i'm sure all of you know that one person in your life who is mostly in a genial mood and no matter what happens always remains upbeat and even manages to laugh at their own challenges sometimes you feel like killing them but these are the oasis of humor in a desert of otherwise dreariness and sadness their good humor will start to rub off on you and soon you too will find yourself smiling more and looking at life from a different perspective which enables you rather than restricts you if you say that you don't know a single person in your life like that my sympathies are with you you please become that person for those around you what else can be done to get humorous well you can lighten up and take yourselves less seriously an essential characteristic that helps us laugh is not taking ourselves too seriously we all known the classic tight jawed sapos who takes everything with deadly seriousness and never laughs at anything such a wet blanket you know i've heard it said that if you think the worst and get the worst you suffer twice but if you think the best and get the worst you only suffer once now some events are clearly sad and not occasions for laughter but most events in life don't carry an overwhelming sense of either sadness or delight they fall into the gray zone of ordinary life giving you the choices to laugh or not so relax every delay is not a disaster every mistake is not a tragedy and every fall is never the end in the words of the american journalist regina brett no matter however bad you may be feeling you must get up dress up and show up everything else will fall in place and next the most important in my opinion learn to laugh at yourself laugh and the world laughs with you laugh at yourself and the world laughs even louder share your embarrassing moments people will warm up to you more quickly when they see you laughing at yourself than at them it conveys the message to your audience that you too are human and prone to slip up now and then nobody likes being around the superhuman who is always perfect and does everything right the first time and every time who wants that lighten up and laugh at yourself another thing that's important when it comes to creating the climate in your life for becoming humorous is to keep things in perspective you know there are about 5 100 million galaxies is what i have read somewhere in which there are another 500 billion planets out of which uh, about 500 million planets are having some form of life and out of that there's this one small tiny piddly fat planet earth in which you are you see that spot on the screen that's where you are so put it into perspective many things in life are beyond your control particularly the behavior of other people a world leader gets elected and it's not someone you like but that's not in your control so don't fret over it and lose sleep while you might think taking the weight of the world on your shoulders is admirable in the long run it's unrealistic unproductive unhealthy and you know what is even egotistical that's what it is What else can you do to get humorous? Aha, uh-huh. there is so much more you can do. You can immerse yourself in humor if you will only allow yourself to see all the humor that's there around you. You can go watch a funny movie or a TV show. Okay, you don't want to go. Open your laptop. click on youtube you can watch so many funny videos on youtube and another favorite of mine if you can 
check out improv comedy clubs and shows i highly recommend this i came across improv in 2017 thanks to toastmaster savin hegde and i've fallen in love with it ever since it gives you the freedom to be spontaneous to tap into that core of creativity and fun that is there inside every one of us people i just can't tell you enough if you haven't tried it out go try out improv go to a comedy club there are so many comedy clubs around today read the funny pages in newspapers and magazines read those little strips that come every day even if you don't understand what is the joke ask someone who did no harm in asking right if you come across a good joke that someone told you at work come home and share it with someone that way you get better at telling a joke and the more you do something the better you get at it yeah go to a bookstore check out the humor section i i don't know about the bookstores in bahrain but here in dubai we have this huge bookstore called the kinokunia and you can go there and you can sit from morning till dusk and you can go through all the books there and they won't say anything go check it out have a game night with friends it can be board games it can be card games dart games anything attend a laughter yoga class I don't know how many of you attended DTAC in April this year here in Dubai, but if you'll remember my friend Toastmaster Sylvia King and her laughter yoga routines, it kept the audience in splits. If you have children around, goof around with them. They are so much fun. Do something silly, don't be uptight. Make time for fun activities like bowling, miniature golfing, go for karaoke, anything that will break you out of your routine and force you out of your comfort zone the bottom line is becoming humorous is a do-do thingy you can't sit in your corner and wait for humor to come to you only humor will come not humor for humor you have to step out of your comfort zone and exercise that humorous muscle what else can you do now this is something that i'm sharing with you which i have done in my own life and that is remember your aha moments i'm sure all of us can uh, um, identify with this when i say that there must have been moments when you attended a meeting when you were called for table topics and the topic was given and you went up there and you spoke something and after you shook hands with the tmod and came back to your seat ah oh, shit i should have said that or when something was happening between colleagues at work and somebody said something funny and you had this brilliant retort in your head but you didn't say it for whatever reason and you come back home and you say yes shucks, i should have said that well here's my advice to you all these aha moments don't let them slip away from your memory why because those moments are your sparks of creativity which only you have inside you no one else in the world knows about it it's not come out onto google yet so those are gems they are gold mines for you so store them you can use it later i'll give you an example i once did the role of g at penta toastmasters club it's now called the pinnacle club many years ago and that and uh, that meeting the theme of the day was about women of substance i was the g and i got an idea of saying something humorous in my g address that would be in line with the theme. I plan to talk about my mother who had brought up her four children single-handedly on the salary of a school teacher in India and how now after 35 years of her four children, out of her four children, three were doing extremely well for themselves and the fourth was still struggling as a G, but there was hope for him. This was what I had in mind to do before I went up on stage. But after I went up on stage, I completely forgot about that. It was only after I came back and sat in my seat that I said, aha, I should have said it. But I didn't forget those lines. I wrote it down. I kept it running in my imagination. And believe it or not, one and a half years later, I got an opportunity to use those lines in my P10 speech where I said that of my mother's four children, three were doing really well while the fourth was struggling to complete his P10. And that cracked up the audience. So remember your aha moments. Visualize yourself using your funny lines and getting the desired reaction from your audience because those are your own moments of spontaneous creativity which only you know. They are gold for you. Mind them for all its worth.
All right. Now, I've told you all these things about what you can do to become more humorous. Now, there is a thing about humor that it's not one kind of humor for everybody. And you'll have to find out what amuses you. A lot of times we might say things purely to please others. We flatter friends or colleagues by praising a change they made. We bring up topics that we know others might be interested in. However, when it comes to being funny, don't tweak your sense of humor to cater to other people. Instead, start with what amuses you. Then if you think the other person will also be amused with it, share it with them. You will be funniest when you find something amusing and delightful. That is the starting point before you wonder about other people's opinions. Humor is something that should not be a strain, but a pleasure. The harder you strive to make others laugh, the lesser will you laugh. Make sure you find it funny and you laugh first, then you can share it with others. If for those of you who have seen me on stage, you all know what I'm talking about because I'll be the one laughing the loudest for my own punchlines. And because I'm laughing so much, the audience has no choice but to join along with me in the laughter. So find your funny bone, learn what amuses you and start working on that. That will be your strength. Having said that, even though, okay, let's say you found your funny bone, you've learned what amuses you. Can you just go ahead and say it at, in any setting, in any crowd, in any situation? No. Be aware of your audience. What's sauce for your goose need not be sauce for the gander. Even if a remark is absolutely tear jerking, knee slapping, hilarious, it can be considered in poor taste if you say it in the wrong situation. This type of observation and restraint is a whole other can of worms. <laughs> I remember an incident years ago when I was much younger and more foolish than I am, than I am now. My uncle underwent a serious operation to remove a portion of his intestines that had become cancerous. All family members, young and old, everybody was there in the hospital waiting area to know the outcome of the operation. Then a nurse came and informed that the operation was successful. And she then showed the portion of the intestines that had been removed. I took one look at it and blurted that it looked like an overgrown sausage. My siblings and all my cousins who were there, they burst out laughing. But suddenly there came this wail of grief. It was from my grandmother who burst into tears saying that while her son was going through a life-threatening operation, here we were laughing a laugh at his expense. She did not find it funny at all. And now years later, I can understand why. So know your audience before you crack a joke. Moving on, when you have cracked a joke and you did not get the response you thought it would, don't continue with it, my friend. Don't flay a dead horse. If it's dying, let it die. Few things are more cringeworthy than when someone tries to continue a bad story. Sometimes it's not a fault with the story or the joke you're saying. Maybe it's just not a good fit for the audience. Or maybe it's just poor timing. Maybe you're not as comfortable telling it. So you can't deliver it properly. Either way, just let it die. Better yet, you end it yourself. I'll tell you an incident that happened. When I was a G for the 200th anniversary meeting of Dreams Toastmaster Club here in Dubai, there was this great speaker, Toastmaster Sedika Kebi from Lebanon, who came and delivered a very moving speech about growing up during the civil war years in Lebanon. In her speech, Sedika spoke about how she had to wear a tight shirt, how she had to wear a tight shirt as a school uniform, and how it became tighter as she started to grow and develop. And then she gestured with her two hands in front of her chest. I found it very funny, but nobody else laughed when she said it. So when it came time for me to do the G role, I commented on that point and I tried to make it sound funny. But to my disappointment, there was absolutely no reaction from the audience. Jesus, Jesus sat there staring blankly at me. So I immediately blurted out, well, that didn't go too well, did it? And that cracked them up. They all burst out laughing. So I realized that the moment you realize a joke is not going down well, the best thing to do is pull the plug. Just end it. It can be a bit of an awkward end. It can bruise your ego a little bit, but 
it saves everyone's time and patience and in the long run they'll respect you for what you did so don't play a dead horse let it die its own death having said all this having come to this stage where you now have an idea of what it takes to be humorous there is one very 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 important quality that i would want all of you to have if you really want to embrace humor in your life and that is embracing your vulnerability don't be afraid to express your vulnerability allow yourselves to express it frankly freely authentically it's the willingness to share yourself with others authentically and without apology we are all humans with feelings and emotions that are there for good reasons if we are too stiff and guarded when it comes to expressing our emotions then nine times out of 10 we will not be relaxed and comfortable enough to see the humor in a situation humor is everywhere if you will just look for it by giving ourselves permission to be vulnerable we give ourselves permission to be human i'll read a, a personal incident that happened to me once i'd asked my fellow club member alexander thomas to play the role of a humorous speech contest chair for a club contest so he called me up and said robert i need some help and guidance how to go about playing this role i told him alex just relax and tickle your funny bone and see what comes up very seriously he answered back robert in all my years of life on earth that's the one bone that has never showed up on any of my x-rays so i really don't know what you're talking about that cracked me up and i told him to state exactly those lines which he did and it was a big hit with his audience so my friends don't be afraid to express your vulnerabilities in doing this you will relax into your natural sense of humor and that will be seen by your audience as being authentic now i could go on and on and on on this point of embracing your vulnerability and how sacred it is not only for becoming a humorous person but also for becoming a human being i will advise all of you to read the book daring greatly by brene brown who has spent two decades studying and researching on the topics of vulnerability shame and empathy go and get the book and read it i hope it touches you as it has touched me right moving on having said all that i said about how to get humorous and what are the pitfalls of being too humorous and not being aware of your audience and about embracing your vulnerability let me also tell you a bit about the different types of humor that is out there in today's world uh, the most common type that you will find everywhere is physical or slapstick humor notably characterized by charlie chaplin and the laurel and hardy type of movies in this type of humor it's all exaggerated or wild body movements with gags pranks and practical jokes involved but it always has to do with the body or comedy around the body behaving oddly it's okay for a while for a bit but continuous slapstick comedy will wear you will wear you out you won't find it funny for a long bit of time so a bit of slapstick humor is fine but not always another humor that you will find is self deprecating humor like it says in this uh, tweet that i'm going to hate you're going to hate yourself in the morning if you stay up late jokes on you i'm going to hate myself in the morning no matter what this is where you are laughing at your own self when someone is a master at self deprecating humor it means they are good at putting themselves down or making fun of themselves on purpose to amuse others it is done in a way that makes everyone laugh rather than feel bad for them this kind of humor makes people feel comfortable because the person who is cracking the jokes he seems real and humble and able to make themselves vulnerable enough to laugh at themselves it breaks down people's barriers and they get more open with you so this is a good humor which i will encourage you all to try out another kind of humor that you will find is uh, surreal or absurd humor uh, it's a little too weird for my own taste and there is a group of people who like this kind of humor so i won't go much about it but yes there is this type of humor 
improvisation or improv humor. Now, improv is a form of live theater where everything is made up on the spot. The characters, the relationships, the environment, the context, everything is made up on the spot. It's quite a difficult thing to pull off comedy in the moment or on the spot. But oftentimes, that awkwardness is what makes it funny. If you want to know more about this, go watch Whose Line Is It Anyway and Saturday Night Live. These are great examples of improvisational humor. What other type of humor is there? Number five is witty or dry humor. Now, sometimes this is called deadpan humor or sarcastic humor. Now, this, this can be the most difficult humor to detect. It is an intelligent kind of humor that is the complete opposite of slapstick humor. Witty humor requires your mind to be active and engaged. It may not always be laugh out loud funny. It is the kind of humor that can hurt someone else's feeling when used in a mean way. But when used gently, it can be funny without putting someone else down. And if you ask me, I will tell you, use it sparingly and only when you know the characters involved very well. Some of the people, the great figures in history who were great at this kind of humor, Winston Churchill, Oscar Wilde, George Bernard Shaw. George, uh, there's a story that a uh, famous actress once came to George Bernard Shaw and said, uh, sir, if uh, we both marry, then the child that is born to us will have my beauty and your brains. And George Bernard Shaw quit back saying, yes, my dear, but what if the child has my beauty and your brains? And that was the end of the conversation. So this is called witty or dry or sarcastic humor. The other kind of humor is wordplay humor or puns, which uses phonetic mix-ups such as spoonerisms, obscure words and meanings, and rhetoric, oddly formed sentences, etc., etc. For example, what do you see on the screen? What kind of shorts do clothes wear? Thunder wear. Today at the bank, an old lady asked me to check her balance, so I pushed her over. Did you hear about the optometrist who fell into a lens grinder and made a spectacle of himself? This kind of humor also requires a certain level of intelligence to be able to pull it off. And this kind of humor is also not very easy to detect if you're not at that same level as which the person who is parlaying it is doing it. Yeah. Another type of humor is what we see in a lot of stand up comedy shows, which is uh, uh, no. Okay, potty humor. Potty humor is where it's, it's juvenile humor, gag jokes, toilet humor. You can see what I have shown you on the visual. That's exactly what it means, potty humor. I'm not going to say anything more about this. Another kind of humor which you will see mostly in stand-up comedy shows is observational humor where the stand-up comedian takes everyday things that happen in an average person's life and brings out a humorous twist to it and presents it in a very, very satirical manner, which really makes it so funny and the whole crowd is guffawing in laughter. That's observational humor. This is something which you too can get to be good at if you start to pay attention to all the little things that happen in and around you every day. You'll pick up on stuff that if you look at it from a different perspective, can be really, really funny. So that's observational humor. And finally, it's dark or sick humor. Now, what is dark or sick humor? It is where people find humor in places which you wouldn't expect to find. A, doc, a dark topic would be death, for example. If you ask me, this type of humor is most likely to offend others. And so it is best tested on your friends who love you unconditionally. Otherwise, you're asking for trouble. Having said all that I've said, where are you going to use humor? If you fo start following all the steps that I've given and you start following all the cautions that I've given and you've mastered the art of humor to a certain extent and now we are ready to put it to use, where will you use it? You can use it at home, in your personal relationships. It will ease friction and aid better communication. You can use it at work, especially when it involves teamwork and projects and presentations. When you have to convince another to adopt your suggestion or idea, you can use it in situations of conflict to diffuse highly charged states and individuals. 
when you're when people are anxious you can move use it then to calm them down and ease their concerns when you're feeling down and dispirited you can use humor to boost up energy levels nothing like a good belly laugh the avenues are many and it's up to every individual as to how and where and when to employ humor and that brings me to the closing section of my webinar and that is learning the art of being humorous can be a life-saving skill which i sincerely recommend to each one of you life will put you into so many situations that your school college and management school books never actually prepared you for humor will be your greatest tool to navigate through all such instances and allow you to still remain sane and fruitful and grateful at the end of it all maybe some of you came here to listen to the webinar to see if i will give you some good tips about how to craft a humorous speech but my hope and wish for you is beyond just one speech i want your every conversation to be peppered with a dose of humor i want your life to be filled with ample amounts of humor i want you people to go out into the world and spread humor around friends there's only one thing certain in life and that's death so why not die laughing than go crying and mourning together we can all reduce global whining and hope to heal every tumor with humor thank you so much for your listening ears and the opportunity given to me thank you sarah yeah. over to you <laughs> that was excellent i'm just waiting in for any questions that people would have i can see some hearts and lots of love coming your way but does anybody have any questions for our speaker session on why we should smile while we still have our teeth that should bring in some questions ah there i can see our first question robert the first question for you is how can i work on my humor when the topic is serious ah great good question if okay let me ask you back with a question are you asking this from a context of having to prepare a speech or a presentation on a serious topic is that so or are you asking from a context of having to answer it on the moment on the spur of the moment on your feet without any time for preparation what is the context in which you're asking this question it's for a speech i believe all right if it's for a speech my advice to you is write out your speech as seriously as possible don't make any attempt to try and include humor in your first draft you write it out in the in the manner that you best see fit and make sure that the message that you want to convey is there in the speech as condensed and succinct and brief as possible once you've done that now you take the draft sit with it and go through every para of that speech of yours and see where you can start injecting humor now the thing about injecting humor is it's not that in every para you should inject the super humorous punchline which will, will have people falling off their chairs no it's enough if people just break out of that serious state into a genial state into a relaxed state you do it gently maybe not in the first para maybe in the second para maybe in the third para you preserve your knockout punch somewhere just before the close and then you go back to a serious closing so that's how you can employ humor into a serious speech i hope i answered your question okay moving on to another person uh, we have navnita krishnan who has a question for you robert humorous speech can be excelled by practice or more of a timing sense navnita 
it's both you can't just do away with practice and only go around perfecting your timing because nine times out of ten hard work trumps talent you can be the most funniest person on the block but if you have never put in the hours required you, when you get up there on stage and see the audience all your talent will be of no use so it's it requires the timing sense it requires practice timing sense you can practice that every day wherever you are at home at school at work at play you can practice that in your daily conversations the actual speech practice you have to put in the hours there's no shortcuts to that there's no going around that both of them are needed if you want to make your speech a really laugh out loud one Thanks. i hope i answered the question yes you definitely did um we have harish krishnan who says robert brilliant insights insights can you repeat the book again on vulnerability which you referred all right this the title of the book is Daring Greatly. The author's name is Brené Brown. You can look her up on uh, the TEDx videos also. Her speech on vulnerability has got about 11 million views. She's got her own website. Her name is spelled B-R-E-N-E-B-R-O-W-N, -E -E Brené Brown. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, Surya Narayan says, Lots of humor is already there on the net. So how to be really original and genuine? Very I good question. You, yeah, go ahead. Lots of humor is already there on the net. But let me tell you, Surya, from my own experience, I have also scored the net for humor. And not everything that is there in the print medium is there on the net. I can tell you that I've read scores of books where I've found nuggets of humor, mother loads of humor, and I've never seen that anywhere on any uh, Google page or any other site. So it's not like everything that is there to be said about or to be written about humor is out there on the World Wide Web. Yes, there's a whole lot of information on the World Wide Web, but there's still a whole lot more which is not there. And when you go out looking for humor on the web if you are going to just cut and paste it in your speeches after a while it's going to fall flat because everybody has access to the net just as you do everybody is going to know that ah he's lifted it from there he's cut this from here oh i saw this in that program no if you find something funny take it tweak it to your taste make slight alterations to it don't use it in the same context where you where you saw it or heard it take it and post put it into a different context and then deliver it then it becomes your joke it becomes your punchline and that brings about a whole new perspective to the audience who's listening i hope i answered your question uh, robert next we have vp menon he says good session robert and saira my question is how do we understand the different types of humor which is prevalent amongst different nationalities and cultures since each culture has its own unique humor favorites okay how do you understand different types of humor among different nationalities and culture it depends on the nationalities and culture that you come into most contact with for example if you come into contact with a lot of americans it's slapstick comedy that mostly prevails there and uh, improv improvisational humor you'll find this in a lot of europeans uh, if it comes to witty humor especially with puns and double entendres you'll find this uh, in in people from uh, uk a lot who have a good command over the english language so it all depends on which nationality you interact with on how much uh, on a consistent basis once you cut for example if it's say scandinavians you interact with on a consistent basis i don't know whether they even have a sense of humor but you can go and read up on it and find out more on that and that's how it will give you an exposure to 
which homo humor to employ with which nationalities? I hope I answered your question, BP. Definitely sounds like it. <laughs> Robert, Mo Mohan Kamath would like to answer, ask your question. We can be humorous with people whom we know. How can we be humorous when we talk to strangers? My answer to that, Mohan, is better to be safe than sorry. Because mm -hmm. I myself have been guilty of this uh, uh, wrong, this error, many a times in my youth when I was much more foolish and wild in my ways. I thought, I find it funny. Why didn't they find it funny? So it's always better to err on the side of caution when it comes to strangers and how you're going to deal with them. Break the ice gently, crack a mild joke, see the response. If the response is just a stiff grin, then you know that the threshold of humor is very low. If the response is a wild guffaw, then you know that you can go a bit further. I hope I answered your question, Mohit. Faraz Farooq from Bahrain would like to ask you this. Uh, there may be humorous situations in day-to-day -day life, hilarious in that particular situation at times, but not apparent when narrated later. How to use such in a speech? <laughs> I totally empathize with this. I totally empathize with this. In my uh, earlier days when I was taking my baby steps uh, with the humor and trying to be as humorous as my uncles who, with whom I grew up with, uh, many a time I would see this incident happen and I would remember everything that happened and I would come to my friends and I would try to tell it and they would just stare at me. It took me a while to understand that even in humor the context is very very important you can't just blindly take a joke out of context and place it in another context and expect it to work you look for similarities you look for people who will be attuned to receiving the kind of joke that you have in mind to tell them you can't just walk up to a person who you have a, a brief a minor a bare relationship with and tell them something and expect them to start laughing straight away. You will first work with the persons who you deal with on a daily basis, find out what is the funny that tickles them. And then these instances of humorous incidents, which you saw somewhere, start sharing it slowly, slowly, slowly. As you do it, like I said, humor is a muscle thingy. The more you exercise the muscle, the better you get at it. The less you exercise the muscle, the weaker the muscle is going to be. So keep doing it and you will get better at it. Faraz, did I answer your question? <laughs> Robert, you can have a gulp of water maybe. We have lots of people thanking you. Andrew Luckman, Mohammed Al Dosari, all these people are writing in to say what a fantastic session it's been. So that's nice. And I'll give you your next question, which is, from Kiran Gopalakrishnan, she says, trust the hold of the language we are delivering has an important part in comedy. Can you repeat the question again, Sarah? Yeah, basically she's asking about the language. She says, trust the hold of the language we are delivering in has an important part in comedy. Okay, good question. And my answer is yes and no. Yes, the hold of the language in which you are communicating does have an impact on the humor that you're trying to deliver. If you are absolutely confident about yourself and your command over that particular language. If you are not, and if you feel a little, uh, if you have feelings of insecurity within you about how you are coming across in your command of that particular language that you are employing to convey your humor. This, whether you are aware of, uh, aware of it or not, will be felt by the listeners. It will be transmitted by your body language. And body language, I think even last uh, webinar, uh, Sujit spoke about this. Body language is something that no matter how hard you try, it will always speak the truth. 
So the truth is, if the language that you're employing uh, to convey your humor is something that you don't have a hold over and you are not, you are aware of this and you have a feeling of insecurity within you, your body language will betray you and your audience will first absorb your body language before they even absorb the words that are coming out of your mouth. So in that way, yes, the language that you're employing is very, very important. If you have, if you're confident over it, if you are not, no, I said yes and no. If it's also not important, if you don't care, if you don't give a damn about your hold over the language, all you care about is that you want to deliver your punchlines the way you feel it is best, the way it makes you laugh. I don't know how many of you were there for uh, the, the Division B contest uh, where one of the speakers, he was not from Dubai, he came from outside and the title of his humorous speech was, I don't like questions. His command over the language was not, not at all all that great, but, but he had the audience roaring with laughter. And what it showed was, he didn't care that he did not have a command over the language that he was using to convey his humor. All he cared about was that he found it funny and he really believed that it was something that he had to share with his audience and that he there too would find it funny. And so his body language came across, which was absorbed by the audience and they reacted in like manner to him. So that's the thing about the language that you use. If you are confident over it, use it. If you are not and you have a self-esteem problem about it, work on it or don't use that language. If you don't have a command over the language, but you don't care because you're so confident about the things that you want to convey, the things that make you laugh and the things which you believe will make others laugh, go ahead and do it. It all boils down to your self-confidence. I hope I answered your question. Uh, Francis Devota, is he related to you, Robert? Because Francis, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have he meant here. Uh, it is informative and interesting ideas on usage of humor. He's enjoying your session, obviously. All Just right, want to you. let you know. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, I said thank you to Francis for that. Okay. And I believe Mr. Mohammed Al Dosari would like to ask you a question, and his mic has been unmuted. Mr. Al Dosari, would you like to ask the question? Mm. I can't hear anything. Yeah, me too. I'm just waiting. One second, hold on. Can he type it? One second. Yeah, that would have been easier, but uh, one second. Okay, I think we're roundabout finishing our time. Uh, and we'll probably have to send a personal message to him regarding his question because there is, uh, his mic is unmuted, but I can't hear from him. So, all right. Uh, I believe that brings us to the end of the session, Robert. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. Thank you to District 20, you and the PQD Toastmaster Salim and the Division Director for Division C, Jahangir Khan. Thank you so much for this opportunity and especially thank you to every one of you listeners who took the time to log in, to register and to log in and sit and listen to this webinar. I hope you found it useful. If you have any further queries, if you need any further help with anything to do with humor, you can always reach out to me through Sarah. Sarah will share my contact details to all of you and I am open to answer all your queries. Let's all work together to reduce global whining and make this world a much more better place to live in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. This is Mohammed Salim. The program quality director just for the information uh, robert was mentioning about a speaker i don't like questions the speaker was from bahrain he was name was toastmaster arasan actually he was the mm -hmm. district champion in the year 2015 in Karek, Dubai. there you go there you go thank you Bert. that was such a brilliant speech and the whole audience loved it and it was evident that he was not the master of that language but he was so confident about it <laughs> Thank you very much.
to the end of session number four. We have a few more questions coming in, but we are running out of time. So we'll address them directly with the person uh, asking the question. At the moment, I'd say Toastmaster Robert has just taken us through 45 minutes of wisdom, pure wisdom on how to get through life and to keep that grin alive while spreading the cheer. A big thank you to him from all of us here. And of course, audience, you've been brilliant as usual. I see your presence on the screen in front of me and it fills me up with total gratitude. Thank you. Thank you Do so much. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Robert. Do write in to me with your feedback. And if you have any other questions as well, write in to me and I'll forward it across to Robert as well. It is syra.runj at gmail.com. That's spelled S-A-I-R-A -A dot R-A-N-J at gmail.com. I'll get in touch with you shortly. So join me next week, same time, same place, 4 p.m. Bahrain time on Friday, the 11th of October, 2019. Our session is going to be covered by a champion speaker and evaluator, Toastmaster Nisha Shivram, who will run us through how to develop effective evaluation skills. So block it into your calendar. And until we meet again, this is your Stroli signing off for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>